Rav, welcome to the Rev Amp podcast show. We're happy to have you aboard here today. And for those at home who haven't had the privilege of meeting you already, please just maybe share your name, your role, and a little bit about your, uh, the company that you're now working with. Yeah, I thank, thank you, Gideon. Really happy to be here. And, and congrats on the recent um, investment round. I think that that's great for RevOps in general, but also super good for, for Deal Hub. So congratulations. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so Rob Levy, um, I'm, I'm a native Zimbabwean originally via London for about 12 years and been in the States for nearly 20 years now. So kind of traveled around the world with, with my job, which has been fun. Um, been in sales ops pretty much most of the time, progressed to what you know is being called RevOps now. Um, I'd argue that I've done that for years because it's always been about collaboration with sales marketing and customer success but you know most recently took up a role at a company called monotype mm -hmm. that is the world leader in fonts so kind of moved outside of my comfort zone which has traditionally been around security um, moved into the world of designers and creatives and marketing and fonts and actually learned that there's a big business to be made in fonts um, but from my perspective, the challenge was a company that was growing, um, been around a while, but growing, looking to reinvent themselves in a SaaS kind of model um, and looking for you know, ops expertise, particularly on that after sales service of customer success. And so that, that really drew me to the company and um, you know, delighted to be with them and, and hopefully making an impact. As you're speaking there, Rob, I'm thinking about your own personal brand, and there must be a play there for secure your own font, you know, your previous life in security <laughs> and your current life in fonts. I bet I can put them together somehow and create a brand for you. But anyway, putting that to the side, um, <laughs> I'd love to hear more about the challenges for you in RevOps now, I guess more so uh, at Monotype, specifically within the area of forecasting. From what I understand from you, from our prior conversation, is that Monotype almost has several business models or, or functions that, that coexist. For example, the self-service where people transact online through the website and make purchases that way. You also have direct customers that have direct relationships with your sales or account managers. Uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. And I guess there was a coming together of all of these revenue streams for you as you took on that role and, uh, and a need for you to make sense of it and add clarity and, and everything. That, can you just kind of maybe position the challenge that you stepped into? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you describe it very well that, that there certainly are a number of aspects of business. And this is a company that's been around for a, a number of years for 15 plus years. Um, where the business originally was a lot of embedded fonts in printers. So, you know, making massive deals with some of the bigger printer companies, you know, from 10, 15 years ago to OEM deals with auto, automotive manufacturers where there's royalties on every car sold. And Tesla has a, you know, electronic panel where you're looking at their fonts when you're driving to work. Um, to traditional, you know, brands and enterprise where companies are growing their brand and they want simplicity and consistency in the way they use their fonts and promote themselves through brand, you know, and, and use Monotype for that. So in, in addition to an online business that's growing where people just pick up fonts online, you know, for a couple of thousand bucks. So a lot of diverse businesses coming together, but the growth engine really being around enterprise. And so when I joined and spoke to the CFO, the CRO, who's my boss and the CEO, I said, what do you want? You know, what's the most important thing for you? And it, it undoubtedly it was predictability. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, we need, we need our forecasting to be accurate so that we can understand the predictability of our business and look forward and be able to, you know, make pivots, make changes ahead of time rather than be, you know, stamping out forest fires. And that, that was really the genesis of it. So I understand from you that you have a rule of thumb that perhaps you inherited a situation where forecasting got really accurate in the closing stages of the quarter, but your rule of thumb was more about being able to predict with confidence or sorry, for, forecast with confidence from a much earlier stage. Tell me about, you know, your 10 day, 10 day, 10 week rule of thumb that, that you shared. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> if you've been around sales ops for a while, you know, everybody forecasts and everybody has a forecast every, meeting every week. And sales leaders tend to look at the deals and go top down, most important deals down. And the, the tools have got a lot better. You know, you, you guys, there's, there's a number of tools out there and call it rev intelligence, sales intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, AI has made that business, you know, the business of forecasting a lot easier with tools. But at the end of the day, I've looked at it and gone, you know, there's still a lot of focus on the per deal aspect. And that's kind of bottoms up. Um, we've moved towards looking at stages in the pipeline and stuff. Um, but for the most part, it comes down to the top deals. And so that iterative pro process of how your deal's progressing along the pipeline through the quarter leads to a forecast that, as you say, you know, as you get towards the end of the quarter, it becomes more and more predictable. But at the beginning of the quarter, when you may not have your pipeline fully flashed, and depending on the velocity of those deals, you may not even have some deals in the pipeline yet that are going to close in quarter. Right. So the earlier you can get to forecasting accuracy in the quarter, the better. So, you know, I've used a term that I've kind of coined um, day 10, week 10. Right. Which is the beginning of the quarter for me is not day one. <laughs> let everybody take a deep breath. Let the sales force refresh their pipeline. Mm -hmm. Deals that may have slipped or closed, you know, give them, give them an opportunity to interact with the customer and just have a look at that early pipeline. Um, and then by day 10, have a cutoff. And for me, <laughs> this quarter coming July 4th in the US is always a tough one to get it in because the, the rest period at the end of the quarter is a little bit longer than normal, but day 10 gives you a good snapshot. And for me, that was embed and, and introduce a concept where everybody on the sales team, but also everybody in the company, the CFO, the CEO, the CRO are all part and parcel of the forecast and buy into it and put a line in the sand on day 10. Does that model from your experience, Rob, work equally well for SMB deals versus enterprise deals? Does the same model serve both or does it, yeah. lean, or does it lean one way from your experience? No, it, it, it serves both because, because look, you, you're looking at a snapshot of the pipeline at that day 10 and then hopefully your forecast stays pretty consistent unless major things change until week 10. And that's kind of end of month two, if you're looking at a quarterly forecast and you know not monthly. Um, but you've got three weeks to go where you do that final kind of scrub and say, look, get everything out of the pipeline that isn't gonna close or doesn't have a hope in hell um, and just focus on those deals that do. And that gives you two points in time where you can really benchmark yourself for accuracy. Um, Go on, was there anything more that you wanted to share? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of that is it's like tools help. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, garbage in, garbage out. You've got to get your sales force absolutely embedded, um, believing and understanding the why of the forecast so that they keep the hygiene up to date. You know, because if you've got deals sitting there that have no chance of closing, that haven't moved along in the stages, that have wrong expected close dates, or that the reps are just fudging, you know, keeping their, their sales pipeline up to look good, you know, that doesn't serve anybody. So for me, you know, the first part is the why of reps need to understand that this isn't going to, you know, this isn't a system or a, an, an exercise that's going to beat them up for not having a good forecast, um, you know, so it shouldn't be related to the budget, you know, what's the budgeted number this quarter and does our forecast line up with it? Mm -hmm. It should be an assessment of what's the real state of play down to the rep level. And for me, the why is to show them that if you're struggling or you haven't got enough pipeline or you need additional help, you know, from marketing or product development or whoever around the company or executive bridging, um, or you just struggle, you know, you're very good at generating pipeline, but you're struggling more to close pipeline. All of those things come into play to say, this is a red flag. This is helping you put up your hand and say, I need help. 
um, not as a you know beat you up because your forecast isn't matching what your quota is for the quarter. You know, and, and building that trust is is absolutely pivotal. Have you seen a tangible difference there then for your sales reps that are now kind of buying into this methodology that they're they're perhaps a little bit more real with their pipeline in the earlier stages of the quarter, i.e. day 10. Have adjustments been uh, made in time? Have they been able to then go, okay, this is the real state of truth uh, and therefore there was an intervention or an action that has actually resulted them in being able to recover within the uh, necessary timeline? Has it been a benefit to those salespeople? Yeah, I mean, for me right now at Monitor, you know, we still, I'm still early on in the process, but I've, I've done this at previous companies. Right. And like, for example, when I was at Mimecast, we could really pivot, um, particularly in the days when you had real events and they weren't all virtual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we could have, um, you know, channel events or, or customer appreciation dinners. Um, we could do a lot of events that would drive, may not impact this quarter, but it would certainly impact next quarter, the pipeline that was coming in. Um, we could put more effort with SDRs focusing on specific reps whose right. territories were lacking. Um, but importantly, also the, the sales leaders could coach and say, you know, when we dissected the pipeline at an aggregate level, not on a deal by deal basis, we could say, you know, this rep is really struggling with pipeline creation, does a tremendous job at converting um, the deals that they have, but, you know, she's, she struggles on, on that side of, of pipeline creation versus another rep who may struggle at the conversion and really closing, you know, the deal at the negotiation stage. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, the accuracy of how a deal's moving through the funnel is terrifically important to show them how to self-improve and, and get coaching. So that's where the benefit is. And it, it, you know, it doesn't happen in a quarter. It, it, go, it, lasts, you know, it has, starts to impact over three, six, 12, 15 months. Understood. So now let's, let's take it as read that, uh, <clears throat> that the team are buying into the 10 day, uh, 10, day 10 week approach. Yeah. You uh, as the RevOps leader now have a greater sense of clarity and maybe predictability. What does that now enable you to do that you weren't able to do before? What's the next step? Yeah, the, the next step is, is going out of current in-quarter deals and looking at next quarter and the quarter after. Mm -hmm. And you know, from Monotype's perspective, again, because of the, the um, I wouldn't say peculiarities, but because of the business, you know, every business is different and you've got to look at what impacts your particular business for your forecast. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that I noticed was the categorization of the forecast, not the stage, you know, not whether a deal was at discovery or evaluation or proposal, okay. but the, the, what I call the buckets of deals sort of fell into the traditional committed, you know, a deal that the rep really commits as a category mm -hmm. um, upside where there may be upside on that deal, um, general run rate business, um, which is stuff that, that closes you know, within the quarter, maybe a 30, 40 day sales cycle. So there's stuff already, as, as I said earlier, um, that isn't in your pipeline on day 10, but you know is gonna advance through the quarter and some of it will close. Um, and then of course, there's always pull-ins. You know, there's deals that are sitting out there in the outer quarter that, you pull in or at that week 10 stage, you, you push them out because they're high risk, but you still look at them because you're still working them and, and maybe five or 10% of those actually do come in into the quarter. So for me, that categorization of different buckets of class of deal really helped get more granular and say, you know what, we're driving a lot of business on upside. And what was interesting was, you know, if you've been around a sales force for long enough, you know, upside shouldn't be seen as just a hedge of, you know, well, I'm just going to hide that deal somewhere in the upside. Okay. For us, there was a methodology of there's some real upside here. If we can convert a one-year deal to a three or a five-year term um, or sell additional features or um, distribution rights in terms of fonts. So, 
the reality of, uh, you know, a, a general committed deal of say, I'd been three or 400 K um, in terms of TCV was very real. So we needed a, a method to take that into account because it, it did play into um, the current quarter, but also as we built our pipeline over the next three, six months, what impact are upside deals gonna have and how can we influence that upside and make it happen as opposed to hope it's gonna happen. So it really did impact our longer term thinking mm -hmm. based on the categorization of those deals. I understand absolutely everything that you've shared and that makes a lot of sense. My, one thought that occurred to me as you were sharing that was whether one of the uh, fringe benefits of earlier, earlier and more accurate forecasting is the ability then to calibrate margin expectations. What, what do I mean by that? It's actually uh, imagine if, I'm not confident as a sales rep or as, even as a VP of sales. I'm leaving it down to the wire. I'm discounting left, right, and center to close as much as possible because I'm not confident that they're going to reach the target. So the kind of the before rather than the after picture of what you just described. I'm probably going to have less control or care less about controlling the margin, which obviously is a downside for the company. The, the upside of forecasting with confidence is now actually I can pay more attention to that extra level of detail for the, for the benefit of the company, which is not only how much total revenue I'm gonna close, but maybe what is the actual margin ratios or rates that we're gonna make per deal. Do you see that next step trickle down kind of attention to detail or is that, is that even a real thing uh, for kind of, kind of for your leadership? Oh uh, yeah, it, it's definitely a real thing. Um, you know, if, if, if I could solve the buyer pattern which we've sort of created in the IT world of the buyer waits till the end of the quarter because, you know, as a seller, we've fed them so many times, you know, we'll give you a discount if you close before the end of the quarter. Right. And then we um, start to sell a bit. Yeah, but it's kind of self-perpetuating. So if we could, if I could change that, I think I'd be famous. But, you know, it does help that predictability if you know there's going to be that spike at the end of the quarter. You know, we we've actually got a spiff going this quarter where it's like a champions league um you know in in celebration of of the 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 soccer or the football in europe we've we've got a qualification period and actually qualification is 18th of june and you have to have hit a certain threshold percentage of your bookings target cool. to qualify for the finals um, as it, and it's a team-based award. So it, it's a pretty fun spiff that we've put in place, but just trying to push that, get the deal in earlier, as it certainly helps. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough one that, you know, to really get a hold of discounts and discounting at the, at the end of the quarter. I mean, it's going to happen, yeah. but I think the cardinal sin is, um, not getting that deal at the end of the quarter and then still applying the discount, you know, when they close in July, you know, just at least be strict with the offer you're going to make. Um, that's, that's really hard to do. I've seen that a lot over the years. Uh, yeah. Not from the seller, but from the, from the buyer, you know, oh, we're two days late, we're three days late, but we still expect the same deal that was expected, true. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it's a tough one, but, but in terms of margin, you know, at, at an anecdote here that, former CFO, and I'll plug Mimecast again because I worked with a great CFO there around IPO, um, a very successful IPO that they had. And I said to him, you know, with your SaaS business and the predictability of the recurring revenue model, why is forecasting even important? You know, why am I putting all this effort in? And it was kind of tongue in cheek from me, but it, it, it was also, there was part truth in it that he, he had a pretty good handle on what next quarter's earnings were gonna be very early on in the quarter because they had such a good machine of recurring revenue. Uh -huh. And his answer was very, was very simple and kind of struck me. He said, it's all OPEX driven, Rob. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, we pay commissions and, and we, we apportion the commissions to the quarter, you know, so, it's, it's real time. And he said, if you're having a great, a great forecasting quarter, I know I'm going to be paying more commissions. Uh -huh. So ironically, 
if we're having a bad quarter, I've got more money to play with for marketing because I'm not going to be paying as much commissions over the next three months. And, you know, at a very simplistic level, and he'd, 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 he'd punish me for being that simplistic, but it, it stuck in my mind that the accuracy of the forecast was as much to do about the OPEX in the company and the spend patterns as it was about getting the number right at a top line revenue perspective, uh -huh. because it, it freed up money and it, it, it showed him where he could now actually help and look forward and start driving additional pipeline. Um, you know, and of course, the sort of commissions versus marketing is one angle, but if he could get a good sense of the state of the business looking six months out, he could start planning for bigger marketing events and more marketing spend or increase in headcount, whatever. But it was all OPEX driven as opposed to, you know, where I'd kind of, all my career siloed on looking at the revenue number and saying, did I get that right? It's like, yeah. well, it actually impacted the PL, you know, tremendously. Fantastic, Rob. That's a great note for us to finish on today so that we can stay on time. Um, you've been a fantastic guest. I would love yeah. to speak to you again. I'd love to even know where uh, yourself and, uh, and your company will be six months from now in just the maturity of the program that you're building out right now. I'm sure yeah. there'll be both evolution and revolution one after the other. Uh, but wishing you tons of success. I'll encourage everybody that, that listens to this uh, podcast show and maybe wants to reach out within the revenue operations community to just follow you on LinkedIn, connect with you, maybe even ask a question if you have a uh, time or capacity for that, Rob. Um, but certainly we're wishing you lots of success from, from myself and all of the, uh, the RevAmp team over here at, at Deal Hub. No, well, thank you for the time. And, and yeah, please, anybody listening who wants once, once my advice or just wants to talk rev up some, um, you know, I, I love the subject. I do post frequently on, on LinkedIn and share some of my, some of my stories, trials and tribulations. Um, but I, I just love that there's so much energy in the space and so much um, enthusiasm around revenue operations. Cause you know, I firmly believe that it, it, it's the compass. It drives the direction that the company takes by giving you insights into the future as much as it can. Exactly right, Rob. Great. Thank you so much for being a chief evangelist for RevOps. And, uh, and that's bye from us for now. Thanks again, Jess. Yes. Cheers.